It was such a sensational case. I don't understand why it was so sensational. I, mean, I live, you see how I live, you see my family. I was pushed into this business at a young age, not knowing any different. And we came on a vacation to the United States. And I remember spending two days sitting in our brothel. And I thought that was normal. I, I didn't know it was illegal and it was risque. And I thought if you ran a clean business like Martha Stewart did in her business, there, there was really nothing wrong with it. Nobody did anything they didn't want to do. Nobody was abused. Nobody was manipulated or forced. I never once asked a woman or a man to have sexual intercourse. I had a year waiting list of really incredibly educated women from all over the world seeking to come through my door to get a spot on my roster. The, the fees could be on the low end, a thousand per hour with a two hour minimum, to as high as 25,000 for a weekend, you know, like Super Bowl weekend or something. And then you took a cut. And I got a commission on that, yes. And clients? Clients, I built a regular base because our relationship was based on trust. It was based on respect and understanding that they would always have my loyalty. They were all just people who had, you know, they were tired of the normal and they could afford the bizarre. So for the price that I could accommodate, I could accommodate their secret desires, you know. Right, so you've never named names, although you've hinted that you will. I, to this day, still feel naming names is not the right thing to do. It defeats the whole purpose of who I am. They paid for trust, and I took that payment for trust. If you guys could give us a little peace and quiet. It was a five-year investigation and they came up with one count of prostitution. It was a seven year investigation and it was one count of circumstantial evidence. And the case was never about the prostitution. It was about politics. I was abducted off the street. I was taken to a warehouse on Wooster Street where they turn confidential informants. And I was given the option to go home if I became a confidential informant and I worked for them or I could go the other route, which was I could get a, go down to Central Booking and then I would be heading off to Rikers. What did they want you to do? They wanted me to set up these people and tape record them. The clients? Yes. For? To entrap them, to have, they wanted dirt on these people. They wanted leverage for political gain. Do you have any regrets? My one regret is, is that I took a plea deal because I was bullied by the judge and the district attorney. Why not name names at this point? I was paid for trust and discretion. So you're a convicted felon and you said to me that it's just, you, you know, it's hard, right? What's your life been like? It has been impossible. It's nobody. You cannot go to Walmart and get a job without doing a background check. You're, I was forced, forced to open up a cleaning company that I had to do myself, get down on my hands and knees and scrub carpets and floors and things because my child had to eat. Let's talk about the book. What is it? The scenarios in that book are unique to each person. I picked the most unique ones because they're so surreal that even sometimes when I reread them, I go, nobody's gonna believe that. They're just so bizarre. Secret Desires of the 1% says it all. The title of the book says it all. You're writing also children's books under a different name. Yes. Tell me about that. That is my passion and it's my joy. Um, it's been so lifting for the soul. It's where I feel I can really be the real me. You know, not where I am the the madam, or the millionaire madam, or the soccer mom madam, or the pimp. But I can go into this world with children, and I can bring joy to children. People think that you're feisty, fiery, sassy, Scott. <laughs> um, I have seen the vulnerable side. 
Do you want to talk about that? Um, it's very hard to talk about. Um, definitely the feisty fighter is probably more of the true character of me, but three months ago I lost my son. My son passed away after three months and six days in a coma from a car accident, a part of you Reeves. There's a, a part of you that lives in denial. There's a part of you that can't accept it. I don't know if I'll ever get over it. And I know he would be, he's behind me in this fight against the justice system. You're still a convicted felon. One count of circumstantial evidence, a felony D, which is equivalent to your second DWI. And it ruined my life forever. There's no coming back from it. So overturning it is my only opportunity. And I am fully believe if I'm given access to all the evidence of the seven years of investigation they had me, I have full confidence that we will prevail and I will have a fair trial. And I know my son, I know my son would support that. And I know he's got his wings around me now and he's egging me on. And I will do it and I will make him proud.